Hey, what's up everyone? Hope you're all doing really well. My SD card is broken, or my SD card reader actually is broken right now, so I can't use my DSLR. So just making a screencast this week and hopefully it's still good. All right, software team organization is the topic of this week's video. Short answer to this question is that there are a billion different ways that software teams are organized. Longer answer is watch this video. So there's going to be a lot of text in this video, but as always for these screencasts, just follow my voice, don't read ahead, and I'll just talk about everything I wrote down, hopefully very clearly with everyone, because I spent some time thinking about these notes. Let's start with a couple of disclaimers. So this video focuses on larger organizations and how they organize hundreds of developers. Um, I'm not an expert on this by any means. I'm not an expert on this. I've never had the responsibility of doing this myself as like a director, VP of engineering for hundreds of developers. That's a very big task. My experience, what I'm going to talk about in this video is I what my experience has been being involved in this process as a developer and also the experiences that my friends have had because I have a lot of developer friends. We've worked at different companies, been through many different team organizations and this is just a summary of that so with that being said just follow my voice I hope this video is helpful sorry it's not a real video but screencast will do so before we get deep into it let's just talk about what about smaller organizations we just said we're gonna focus on the larger ones but I want to mention smaller organizations really quickly for smaller groups of coders think less than five people, less than 10 people, and think startups, right? Things tend to be a little more ad hoc. And what I mean by that is that there are fewer people, which means that each person does more things and more diverse things. So fewer people doing more diverse things. One example of this, one person, if you're working at a less than five person startup, there could really be one person handling infrastructure DevOps, backend services, client-side code, user front-end applications, and everything in between. All right, so that's kind of the gist of the smaller organizations. But with that being said, we want to focus about how our bigger organizations split up and organize for software development, and that's for the rest of this video. So let's get straight into it. But I want to break this into three general categories first. You can think of these as umbrella categories and you can also think of this as a spectrum which we'll describe. So on the left side of the spectrum we have big monolithic software development and this is the slowest type of development. On the very right we're gonna have very siloed development where things move very very fast in small groups. Some people call these squads but this just means small groups. So on the left monolithic just think huge and slow on the right we have small and fast and three I'm calling this hybrid but it's everything in between all right so nothing is better than the other everything comes with pros and cons pros and cons for this pros and cons for this and we're gonna walk through it so we're gonna talk about all three of these categories hope everyone's still following so Let's talk about big monolithic development first, and this is usually the slowest kind of development, and I have a lot of first-hand experience with this myself. This is kind of like the environment I was used to when working with like hundreds or 50 plus developers. The gist of this is that there are 50 hundreds, 50 developers working to deliver a single product. Major benefits of a system like this is that it highly encourages code reuse. You can reuse software much easier. It creates a very consistent user experience for the end user. The system is usually integrated better when everything is, you know, to get when everything is close by or monolithic, usually the system is actually integrated better and it's easier to test. Cons of this Obviously, we talked about this already, but the development is just slower because there's lots of blocking. You know, other teams will block your development sometimes, or some people are taking longer than the others. It's a very strict environment, and sometimes it can be less fun. So, 
I was thinking of one way to describe this environment as best I could, and the best word I could think of is this concept of lock step. So in a big monolithic environment, everyone works in lock step mode, and what does that mean? So if you're working on a new software release, let's just, for example, you're, work at, you're working on a big team, and you're working to release version 1.1 from version 1.0. For that to happen, everyone has to come together and prepare their changes to get ready for v1.1, right? If one team is not ready with their 1.1 changes, the whole release is blocked for everyone because the nature of this product being that it's all inclusive, everything has to come together to move it forward. That's what I mean by lockstep. So every team contributes their changes, everything is tested, everything is QA'd, and finally everything is released together. And this is big, huge software, and obviously it moves very slowly. So hopefully you're getting a feel for this style of environment. You can imagine this is pretty tough to do with 50 to 100 or more developers, and you have to be very, very strict with the rules here. Um, you have to be very strict with when to cut off code, commit, code commits, when to cut off people making changes, and how to formalize the release schedules. So in the end, even though it's a very strict, one of the pros, as we discussed, is it's integrated well and it's usually tested better. So even though it's strict, it does come with its pros of you know being probably a little more robust and well tested. Now let's look at the other side of the spectrum. So this is going to be, I call this siloed. This is the fastest kind of development when teams are very siloed and I haven't been involved in this too often, but I have a handful of friends who work in this style of environment. So the gist of this environment is that you maintain small teams, five to 10 people, but your team does everything. And the pros for this development, it's faster, less blocking, you know, less people means less people could be blocking you. It's more fun. It could feel like a startup in a big company and you can make flexible technical decisions. Uh, cons, the bad parts of this system is that it's minimum code reuse because it's very siloed. It can create inconsistent user experience and the system is harder to test and it's not very well integrated. All right, so almost the exact flip-flop of what we just talked about. Um, best thing to do is just take an example and I'm going to walk you through pretty much my friend's work environment which is structured just like this. So. I have a friend who works in a large engineering organization, hundreds of developers, maybe probably not over a thousand, but definitely in the hundreds. So it's a pretty significant team of developers. But how they split up their organization is that there's teams, they call them squads, which is this weird word. It sounds really cool, but their whole team of hundreds of developers is split up into different squads of five to 10 people. So, and each squad is responsible of everything all the way from the computers all the way to the front end. So those five to 10 people are really responsible for everything. So, and it's a super broad category. So what really happens is my friend's squad, I think they have seven people, they get a real budget. They just get cash from the umbrella company. Think of, their, think of it as their parent. They just get a budget, they get some cash and they have to deliver an application. So the squad does everything. They set up all the computer hosting themselves, all the backend services, persistent stores, databases are set up by them and only used by them. All customer applications are made by them, them. And it's like, it feels like its own little mini startup company inside a big organization company. So what this allows them to do is that they can pump out, iterate on their applications very fast. Since they just work in this little five person squad, they're never blocked by any other team like they're never blocked. If you have a team of 50 people, somebody will be blocking you. If your team is only five people, there's much, much less blockage. So it feels like a small company, even though he works at a huge corporation with hundreds of developers. Um, before we move on, let's just consider the bad parts of having things so siloed. One part is that there's really, really little code reuse. Since things are so separated between the different squads, they pretty much implement everything themselves, even though it's a very similar implementation or it solves a very similar problem. V1.1 
because things are so siloed, it's very difficult to reuse software libraries and various modules. The other thing that this leads to is that it leads to a very inconsistent experience for the users across their applications, even though it's the same company. And I think this is one of the parts that they struggle with the most. They move very fast, but you can tell that within one company, there's you can tell that different people created that application, even though it's the same umbrella company. So this is more this affects development less, but you know it looks kind of funny when you're the same entity and you deliver all these different experiences. Um, finally, let's just talk about hybrid apps, and this is the medium between the two extremes. But what this really means is that you're trying to get all the good parts from either monolithic or silo. You're taking all the good parts. So let's just take an example of this. Imagine that there's one team for the whole company. There's one team that's dedicated to infrastructure and computer hosting. So there's only one team for that. Then there are individual teams that are responsible for their own backend services and their own client facing applications. But they must use that one singular team to get their applications hosted on computers. So that creates a choke point on the infrastructure team, right? But at least the infrastructure team is shared. It's not split up across these squads. Um, you can also take this one step further, and this is also a very common setup that my friends have been a part of, but there can be one team dedicated to infrastructure, one team dedicated to backend services that powers all the clients, but then there could be 10 teams dedicated to client-facing applications. So, Let's say, let's take all three as an example. Let's say you're a developer working on the client facing the client facing application. Your team will be choke pointed by the backend team and they will be choke pointed by the infrastructure team. Uh, let's say you're working on the backend team, all right? So let's say you work on the solo backend team. You have to write the code that supports a ton of different applications. Pretty much if you're here, you're working on code that powers 10 client applications, a major benefit of this is you probably get to reuse a lot of the software you've written for many different use cases. And finally, let's say you're working on the infrastructure team doing DevOps, setting up computers, but you'll be responsible for hosting, budgeting for every single application in the entire company. All right, so that's kind of like a hybrid between the two. Finally, let's just conclude this video. Um, whoops. So major conclusion of this video is that it's just a little bit of a taste of how software teams are organized in a very large corporations and gives you a little bit of extremes between huge versus very siloed. But in the end of the day, just remember that there's an unlimited variation of this. And just think of this as a spectrum, okay? Like monolithic developers working on a solo project or very small siloed squads um, and every company any process, every company, every process will be different. All right. And to top, off, top this off, I just want to show you two example companies, which probably are at different ends of the spectrum. One is at Atlassian. I'm sure you know Atlassian. I think they went public recently. This is a pretty famous software company. They've been around for a long time, but you can see like they provide many different software services. They have Jira, Bitbucket, Confluence, Trello, SourceTree, like they have tons of different applications, and I bet each one of these nine or more things has different squads or developers behind them for Atlassian, all right? So that's just their style of company. Here's another example, CircleCI. This is a really good software service to do continuous integration. Uh, I use this at work, and I really like CircleCI, but you can tell that their whole company their whole company is this one product. They don't do anything else. They're literally probably just this section of Bitbucket. They're probably just this part, but they're dedicated for it. So this is probably an example of maybe their software organization is a little more monolithic because everything they develop goes into this service. All right, so obviously those are just two companies, but this is different across all companies. Um, all right, guys, that's it for the video. Hopefully it was a 
little bit of a cool introduction or taste of what software team organization is like. But as always, I can't tell you too much. You just have to go into some companies and figure out how they do things, right? Everyone's going to be different. All right. Take care.